John 18, that's where we find ourselves this morning. So if you want to turn there, we began to look at that text, broached that subject to last week. Jesus has finished celebrating the Pesach or the Passover with his disciples. And, and now the hour has come that he would offer himself as a sacrifice. And we realize that Jesus is in total and complete control. John has written the Gospel of John to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is God. And as God, he is sovereign. And being sovereign, he is in complete and total control of every and all situations, isn't he? And even in this situation, he is still in control. We begin with uh, chapter 18, verse 1. Then Jesus, after he spoke these words, he spoke that high priestly prayer of 17 in which he was praying that he himself would glorify the Father through his suffering. And then he was praying for his own disciples, that they would remain strong, and even though Satan desired to sift them like wheat. He prayed that their faith would not fail them, and it won't. They're being kept. And remember, we looked at that word kept before, and it means to, to prevent from escape. You know, we can never escape the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. So he prayed for his disciples and he prayed for us, for those who would believe according to their word, and that's us. Verse, 18, verse 1 of chapter 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron. And there was a garden in which his disciples entered. Now we talked about the brook Kidron, and the brook Kidron, Kidron means dark or murky. This is a very dark and a murky place for Jesus centuries before who crossed over in that same path, weeping and in tears with sackcloth? David, the king. Why? He was fleeing from his own son who wanted to assassinate him and take his throne. And so David, a type of Jesus here, where he's going to be rejected by his own. But Jesus doesn't want to escape as David had to escape for his life. Jesus is going to traverse that same section. He's going to go back from the east side to the west again and go before the trials that he'll face, willingly offering himself. Hmm? And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Jesus prayed there whenever he wanted to be alone and looking for that solitary place to be with his father in communion. Now listen to me, beloved. One of the ways in which the enemy can captivate our lives and keep us from entering in to the power of the presence of Jesus is by the busyness and the noise of life. It's on my desk. What am I referring to? My cell phone. You know, it's become an appendage for some people, right? You can't be separated from it. Now, now listen to me. I can't encourage you strongly enough that you need to have a quiet time with the Lord every day. That's where you're going to find your strength. If Jesus, being God, fully man, fully God, if Jesus found it necessary to retreat from everything in life and be alone with his Father, to be strengthened and restored spiritually, how much more so you and I? And when you read through the Gospel of Luke, you see how often Jesus in his humanity had to retreat to that special place of his presence, right? I'm not trying to convict anybody. I want to encourage you. As things begin to spin what appears to be out of control, just as if you read this narrative, you would think it's out of control. No, 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 no. Everything is coming together. Everything is falling into place. And so too in our world today. But as things begin to fall into place as God told us they would, and the world perceiving them as being out of control, you need to be strengthened more and more in that special place of his presence, just you and him. Not you and listening to somebody's commentary. Not you and listening to somebody's teaching. Not you and listening to somebody's song. You alone with God and allowing him to speak to you directly. You don't, you don't need an intermediate. You know, I grew up in Romanism, and in Romanism, we had a, a, a mediator between God and us. Who was that? The priest. the priest. Do we need a mediator? No. no. Can't we go to God directly now? Yes. Can I not receive from God? 
You know, it's so important that I don't regurgitate somebody else's message to you. It's so important that I seek the Lord for myself and I receive from God what he would have me to give you. Because every congregation is unique, just like every individual. And the message that God has for you may be different from the message he has for some other congregation, but he'll speak through the pastor. But I need to spend that time cultivating that relationship alone with him in his presence. Now, I ask you, are you afraid to be alone with the Lord? Are you afraid of the silence? That you can't get away from all of that electronic uh, technology? Everybody else's voice? You know, thankfully, you know what's happening with Facebook today? People are abandoning it, aren't they? And, and mass. Facebook has lost uh, half of its wealth, right? Half of its value. What do I always tell you? Get out of Facebook and put your face in the book, right? Put your face in the book. Just you, the Bible, and the Lord, and watch the understanding, the revelation, the experience of his presence that you will gain. Jesus was setting an example for his disciples continually, constantly in his relationship with the Lord. So we too, would, those who are closest to us, and Judas knew exactly where Jesus would be when he needed to be comforted, when he needed to be strengthened, when he needed to be assured, when he needed to be restored. And those that love you, do they know where you'll be? Hmm? So important. Please pray about having that alone time with the Lord. Just you and the Lord and his word. Amen? Hmm. So Judas knew that place. Then Judas, verse 3, having received a detachment of troops and officers of the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. We talked about that last time. They didn't need the lanterns. They didn't need the torches. They thought he was going to hide in some cave, and they'd have to go find him. But nothing but farther from the truth. And besides that, it was so well lit that evening. Why? It was a full moon. Every feast of Israel is a full moon. Remember, it's from full moon to full moon, right? They, when does the day begin for a Jew? Sundown, not sunrise. Sundown. So we go from full moon to full moon, moonrise to moonrise. Hmm? These Jesus, verse 4, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, this is my hour. Right? And that's what he told his disciples previously. This is my hour. Whom are you seeking? And they answered and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus said to them, I am the Tetragrammaton, that four letter Hebrew name for God. And what happened as a result of that? They all got slain in the spirit. That's what it means to be slain in the spirit, to be overcome, to be overwhelmed. And so they all fell down this detachment. Now we're talking about at least a couple of hundred troops fell to the ground when he said, I am, I am. Wow. And Judas, who betrayed him, stood there with them. Now, verse six, when he said to them, I am, they drew back and they fell to the ground. When they asked him again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene of Nazareth. He answered and said, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Hmm. Who's in control? Jesus. Jesus is. Are they going to have to let them go their way? Yeah, yeah. Jesus is the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the great shepherd of the flock, isn't he? John had recorded previously that Jesus said those very words, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus was making sure of the protection of his own until they accomplished all for which he has called them. Do you realize you're under his divine protection? That you're going to accomplish all that he has purposed in your life for the reason why he has called you unto himself? I came here in 1989. I was working for General Electric at the time, GE. I came here under the witness protection program. I came as his witness, and to this very day, I'm under his protection until he's done with me as his witness. People would say, well, who brought you here? I said, GE, God eternal. <laughs> he just used that corporation to do it, right? Yeah. Do you recognize that you are under his protection as his witness until he is through? And then your time of service is over, and then you go home. Glory. Yeah. We were uh, looking at a documentary on the life of George Washington. Do you know how long George Washington fought in the Revolutionary War? 
he and his men. They started out with 30,000 colonial troops, you know, George Washington's army. Uh, at one point, it was dwindled down to 2,500 men. Seven and a half years of fighting. Wow, can you imagine such a thing? I, I can't. And some of those frontiersmen, some of those colonials, they, they fought in the Northeast barefooted in the winter. Scantily clothed, undernourished, sleep deprivation, and yet God, God was with them. George Washington was convinced of that. Seven and a half years of fighting before the end of the Revolutionary War. How about World War II? And we finally entered into the war, and our boys went overseas to fight. And, and listen, it wasn't that they had a 13-month uh, stint or 12-month or stint. You, many of them, you went overseas, and you were there until the end of the war, to the duration. How long did they fight? Five years. Some of those men fought through the entire war for five years. Anybody ever watched the HBO series Band of Brothers? Now, it's very realistic, but it's, it's very true to form. The, the soldiers that survived who were part of that unit, they would give testimony to the fact how accurate the film was with regard to what they went through for those five years. Now, when victory came, V-Day, and their, and their time of service was over, they all chose to stay in Europe? No. They didn't want to rebuild Germany and France? And, no. What did they want to do? They couldn't wait to get home, get home. And I think about that often, you know, just as, now listen, there's, there's a physical war that is fought at times to, to overcome evil, and nations have a responsibility corporately to overcome corporate evil. Isn't that right? But there'll be wars and rumors of wars up until the end, until, until the time that Jesus does come, the Prince of Peace, and brings peace throughout the whole world. But you see, there's, there's also a spiritual warfare and a battle that's taking place even now. And who are those combatants? We are. Are you even engaged in the battle? We, we got into a little skirmish just now with, that we fought. How did we do that? Through prayer. Through prayer. Now, now I, I know that from now until the time the Lord takes me, whenever that may happen to be, either in death or the rapture, I'm in his service. I've been enlisted, and I'm called to serve him every single day for the rest of my life until my serve time of service is over, and then I can't wait to go home. Home. Yeah. What a glorious thought that is, isn't it? Are you engaged? Are you in the battle? Hmm? Jesus is in complete control here. He says in verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he, therefore, if you seek me, let these go. We're under his protection just as much as they were under his protection as we are in his service. Every one of the 11 gave up their lives for Jesus. They gave up their occupations. They gave up their desires. They gave up their dreams. They gave up their hopes to go into the king's service and do the king's will. And therefore, they're under the king's protection, provision, guidance. Is that where you want to be? Hmm? Hmm. Well, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me. I've lost no one. Now, we know that from the synoptics, uh, except who? Yeah. The betrayer. Hmm. Verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. He struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup for which my father has given me? Peter, those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. That's what he said. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man when he returns. What was characteristic of the days of Noah? Relatively speaking to the sword? Evil. Evil was pervasive violence throughout the whole globe. I, I think, what did I read? Was it 60 people got shot in Chicago since Friday? The streets of America aren't even safe anymore. Violence is so pervasive. Everywhere. 
just as in Noah's day, so in our day today, the violence that is taking place. Hmm. Don't you know, Peter, that if I will, my father would send down 12 legions of angels to defend me. How many, how many in a legion? A thousand. 12,000 angels. What kind of damage can 12,000 angels do? Well, we know the damage that one angel did in one night to the Assyrian army. One angel killed how many of the Assyrians? 185,000. Can you imagine what 12,000 angels could do? Oh, my. Hmm. Amazing. Jesus laid down his life. No one took it. He gave it. He's in control. Now, he tells Peter to put away his sword. But what did Peter do in the meantime? He lopped off an ear. <laughs> Luke's gospel tells us what happened immediately after. What did Jesus do? He healed him. He touched his ear. Wow. Now, why did Jesus do that? He got rid of the evidence. Yeah. He got rid of the evidence. There's no evidence to a crime. No crime was ever committed. Why? The man was healed. He was protecting Peter. Otherwise, there would have been four crosses that day, not three. Right? Peter would have been arrested and sentenced and executed. But in his love, he is protecting Peter. You know, no evidence. No witnesses to any crime being committed. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. You ever have a JW come to your house? What's a JW? Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, we had Jehovah's Witness come to my house one day, and I said, look, I'm Italian, and I hate Jehovah's Witnesses. He said, sir, he said, look, I'm telling you one more time. I'm Italian, and I hate Jehovah's Witnesses. He said, sir, what, what, can you explain yourself? I said, yeah, I'm Italian, and we hate any kind of witness. <laughs> You don't get it, do you? All right, forget it. They're not Italian. They're Madigan, they're Madigan, you know? <laughs> My God, it, yeah. Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup with which my father has given me, this cup of suffering, his willingness to suffer on our behalf? Now, we talked briefly, and we said, you know, what, what do you think of this act of courage that Peter performed? Peter said, Lord, wh where are you going that we can't come? Lord, don't you know I'm willing to die for you? Was he? He demonstrated it here, wasn't he? How, how many disciples had swords? Two. And Peter is the one who drew his. What would have cost Peter had that continued? His life. His life. They would have struck him down dead, you know. So Peter, in an act of courage, in an act of boldness, in an act of devotion, in an act of love, showed the Peter that we love, right? He was the leader of this group of men, Peter. He was, he was big, and he was strong, and he was a man's man. And he was a natural-born leader. And he's exercising that, that courage and that leadership ability that he had. But things are going to change very quickly. Let's look at the text Verse 12, and then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Did they bind Jesus? Was Jesus bound? What, what was it that bound Jesus? Love. He was bound by love. He wasn't bound by anything. <laughs> if, if Samson could snap his ropes, what do you think Jesus could do, of course? No, he was bound by cords of love that scarlet cord that runs through the entire Old Testament. What would that happen to be? You know, the scarlet cord that Rahab wrapped around her window to show that she believed. She believed in God. She believed in the God of Israel. She believed in the salvation that would come through the God and the people of Israel. And with that scarlet cord throughout all of the Old Testament running into the New Testament is what? The gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what bound him. His love, not the robes. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. 
Who's Annas? Who, who is Annas? I'm sorry? He was the former high priest. Now, Annas and Caiaphas, his son-in-law, are from what religious sect? No, Sadducees. They were the Sadducees. Now, now remember, now listen, listen, it's real simple. The Pharisees believed in the literal interpretation of the Old Testament. They believed in life after death. They believed in angels and demons. They believed in heaven and hell. That's why they were so fair, fair you see. Right? The Sadducees, they didn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe in heaven and hell. They didn't believe in demons and angels. They said, this is all there is. They were materialists. And that's why they were so sad, you see, right? Because this is all there was for them. Hmm? That's the difference. Now, the Sadducees, unlike the Pharisees, the Sadducees were a political organization with a religious front, okay? They weren't religious people. They were political animals. And Annas was the chief in control. Think of it as a mafioso family, a crime family, like the Biden syndicate, you know? <laughs> he was the godfather. He controlled things. Do you know how many high priests came from the family of Annas? Five sons, one grandson, and a son-in-law. He had complete and total control of what was going on in Jerusalem. And what was the chief end of what they were doing in their enterprise? Making money, exploiting the people, making merchandise of God, interfering in the people's desire to truly worship God and, and experience God. Oh, sad. And so much of that goes on today, doesn't it? Yeah. The uncountry guide that my son has used so often, his name is Doron Heiliger. He speaks five languages. He knows more about the Bible than you, most of you. He, he can recite it by memory. But he said, the one thing that makes him consider that Jesus is very special is what? Nothing sells in Israel like Jesus does. Merchandising, the things of God. Now, he's not a believer yet. Yet. But look at the number of people that merchandise are Jesus. Merchandise, the faith that is so precious to us. And, it, and especially, listen, especially at this hour of the week, Jesus being merchandised all over the West, all over the country. Be careful, beloved. So Annas was the man in control. He called all the shots. And so they brought Jesus to Annas first. How many trials did Jesus go through? Six. If you read the synoptics and you read John's account here, you'll find out that Jesus went through six trials. Three religious trials, three civil trials. They first bring him to Annas. Annas questions him. Now, this is illegal. The whole thing is an illegal process. What, what was illegitimate about this right now? It was at night. You never tried anybody at night. That was an illegality right there. But nonetheless, they brought him to Annas, and Annas starts to interrogate him. Annas starts to try to get him to uh, coerce him into confessing whatever he wanted him to confess. That was against the law as well, to try to induce a confession. And then he released him over to Caiaphas' son-in-law to be sentenced there, to be tried there. And where did Caiaphas send him after that? To the Sanhedrin, right. Now, now the Sanhedrin recognized that they, their power, their authority was limited. What was limited about their authority? I couldn't exact, um, capital right. The Romans took away the right to rule with a scepter. Ruling with the scepter gave you the right of capital punishment. You could put somebody to death, execute them for a capital crime. The Jews, that was taken away from them. They couldn't do that. But even if they could, even if they could, why was it that Jesus would not be executed and sentenced by them? He'd be stoned. And what would be the problem with that, Rob? Broken bones. Yes. Very good. Very good. Not a bone of his would be broken. He would be that lamb, sacrificed for the sins of the world without spot or blemish. No birth defect and no other injuries. Not a bone of his body would be broken. That's, that's one of the reasons why he had to be crucified. 
And so they didn't have the right of capital punishment, and so they said, no, 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 we, we, need, we need to listen. He, we need to convince the Romans that he's an insurrectionist, a farce, just like the January 6th. You know the thing, whole thing is a farce, right? Yeah. The only insurrections that occurred were on the West Coast in Portland and Minneapolis and some other cities in the United States where insurrectionists were trying to burn everything down. But that didn't happen in our capital. But like now, they tried to convince the Romans that Jesus was trying to overthrow the Roman government. It was an insurrection. It was a threat to Rome and to Roman rule. It was a threat to the Caesar. So he had the three trials, Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin. And then what were the three civil trials? Pilate, Herod, and Pilate again. That's right. So they brought him to Pilate, and Pilate's trying to wash his hands of this whole thing. He doesn't really want anything to do with it. You know, this man's no threat to Rome after he talked with him, interrogated him. He said, you know, this man is no, you know, where's he from? He's where? A Galilean. Oh, this is fantastic. I'll send him off to Herod, because Herod was the governor of Galilee, and Herod could try him, sentence him, convict him. But Herod, smart enough to know, oh, no, I'm not touching this with a 10-foot pole. He sent him back to Pilate. And then Pilate, being the political animal that he was, who did he let make the decision? The people. The people. That's what we're going to see in a moment. But here's the point I want to make to you. Now, listen to me. Who is really on trial here? Annas? Caiaphas? The Sanhedrin? Pilate, Herod, the Romans, they're all on trial. Who's the judge? God the Father. Please understand it. When you step back and you see how Jesus responds to all of this, Jesus is the one in control. He's the one. And they led him away to Annas first, and he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest in that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man should die for the sake of the people. Turn with me to John chapter 11. Chapter 11, what happened? Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> he rose Lazarus from the dead. And he had to be very specific. He had to call Lazarus from the grave. Why? Everybody, Everybody would have rose from the dead. <laughs> yeah. But pick it up in uh, verse 45, chapter 11. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. You betcha, right? And they saw Lazarus raised from the dead, now sitting at the table, enjoying Jesus' company, his presence. And, you know, where, where did... Lazarus and Mary and Martha live? Ah, remember last week? What did I tell you? You know, you, you, you don't be a Bethlehem. Don't be a Nazareth. Be a Bethany. Why? He was, what happened in Bethlehem? He was born there. What happened in Nazareth? He was raised there. But, but what was that city next to Nazareth that Jesus loved to visit? Remember that Jesus and his father and his uncles and the men of the village of Nazareth, Nazareth was a blue-collar settlement where all these blue-collar workers resided. It was their bedroom community, but they didn't work there. Where did they work? Zupori or Zephyrus, which is where Herod poured millions of our dollars, today's dollars, in building up Zupori. And so all of those laborers would walk to Zupori every morning to work for the day, and then they'd walk home back to Nazareth. Who lived in Zupori that was so precious and dear to Jesus? Grandma and Grandpa. Nana and Papa, right? Yeah, Mary's parents. Yeah. Born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, worked in Zupori. But what happened in Bethany? He was loved. Jesus was dearly loved by Mary and Martha, Lazarus, and so many others. Now listen, it's, it's important, it's important that you know that it's just not a lot of head knowledge that you're seeking. But it's a heart knowledge. You want to grow in your love for Jesus. 
Because if you grow in your love for Jesus, you'll grow in your devotion to Jesus. You want to be a Bethany because Jesus would respond. Jesus loved those who loved him. Jesus would honor those who honored him. Jesus would spend quality time with those who wanted to spend quality time with him. You know, so it's, it's so important that you and I understand that. An ounce of heart knowledge is worth a ton of head knowledge. Is that true? Yeah. It is, yeah. <clears throat> Verse 47, and then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do for this man works many signs? Which man? Jesus. They're referring to Jesus now. Verse 48, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and the nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Hmm. Not just the Jews who were scattered, but even those of us who would believe, who would come to faith. And it's so, imp it's so important that your belief isn't just in your head, it's got to be in your heart. Chapter 11, verse 26, what does it say? And whoever believes, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yes. Now, what, what's, what's, the, what's the prerequisite? To live in and believe. So a lot of people say they believe, right? It's all lip service. It's not a life of devotion. There's a stark contrast between one who really truly lives in Jesus and one who says they believe. For even the demons say they believe. So it's not enough just to believe, is it? To live a life of devotion. But see, we, hear, we, we see here that the spirit of prophecy working through this evil man. Isn't that an amazing thing? So once again, we see that God can speak through a... Yeah. <laughs> All right, go back to the text, chapter 18. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people and not just for the nation of Israel, did he? But he died for the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus the missionary heart of God to go forth, right? But who enjoys the effect of that sacrifice. Those who really surrender and believe and live in him, you see. It's, it's available to all, right? Or whosoever will shall be saved. Is that not true? Yeah. yeah. But unfortunately, it's a remnant that whosoever will. Hmm. Verse 15 of chapter 18 now in John. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, and he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Now who's that? John. How do we know it's John? Because obviously it had to be an eyewitness account because of the specific information and details that he gives us here in the text. So it had to be an eyewitness. We know that John was one of the eyewitnesses. Now why was it that John was allowed into the courtyard of the high priest. Because what? How did he know the family? <laughs> Who was John's father? Zebedee. Zebedee. John, John had a brother. His name was? James and John. They were both in their father's business, right? Fiorino and son, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but this was Zebedee and sons, right? And what kind of a business were they in? The fishing business. And it appears from extra biblical writing 
during the period outside of the Bible that Zebedee had the contract to supply fish to the high priest. Isn't that amazing? So that's how they knew John. That's how the, the attendants and the servants would know John, that John and his brother James would continually be there delivering fish to the high priest. All things work together. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it? Yeah. But Peter stood at, at the door outside, and then the other disciple, this would be John, who was known to the high priest, went out, and he spoke to her who kept the door, and he brought Peter in. It's nice to have friends in good places, right? <laughs> Networking can be important at times. Hmm? And so John talks to the girl at the gate and says, let him in, he's with me. Hmm? And so he went in. It's nice when you go traveling, if you travel with Rob, because Rob's got all these privileges that he has because he was such a frequent flyer. He's known by them all. You know, he's a million-dollar flyer or something like that. And, and so I travel with him. I get to go priority seating, priority baggage, priority this, priority that. You know, I won't leave home without you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but Peter stood at the door outside. The other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and he spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. And then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, hmm, you are not also one of the men's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. First time he denies him, right? What's, what's happened to Peter? Wait a minute, Peter. This is a detachment of Roman soldiers, temple guards. I mean, they've all come with their weapons. They're ready to do battle. And, and you lop off their servant's ear trying to cut off his head. And, and now before this little servant girl, you say, I, I, I don't know him. I don't know him. Hmm. Verse 18, now the servants and the officers who had made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. A couple things going on here at the same time. We see this situation with Peter and what Jesus had prophesied coming true, but at the same time, Jesus is going through these trials. But what's the problem? What did Peter do, which was a terrible misstep? He denied the Lord. Exactly. You, you, there's a world. Listen to me. Listen to me. Is there any comfort for you in the ungodly? Is there any comfort for you in the world? Is there any comfort for you among those who would hate our Jesus? No. You get, listen, you can't warm yourself. You can't comfort yourself in what the enemy provides. You'll always compromise. It'll always work against you. Bad company corrupts good character always, the Bible says. Bad company or a corrupt or good character always, always. And so here's Peter. Peter chooses to comfort himself. Well, it was cold that night. The other text tells us that. It's more specific. That it was a cold evening, and Peter desired to comfort himself, to warm himself at the enemy's fire, at the enemy's camp, at the enemy's company. It's always a problem when, when someone presents themselves as a Christian, when they're among Christians. They speak Christianese. They know the protocol. They know the behaviors. They know how to conduct themselves. But then, but then they have these associations with the world. And then, and then when the world, well, they know, they know the protocol there, too. They know the language there, too. And they become very, very comfortable. Now, what little creature would do we call them? That, no, 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 that's it, no. What little creature do we call them? They crawl out from under rocks at times, and they can disguise themselves by, by blending into the environment, by changing their colors? A chameleon. A chameleon. A chameleon changes its colors, its form, based upon the environment. Oh, boy. You've got to be very, very careful, beloved, that your spiritual integrity, your strength, your constitution, your resolve is precisely what it should be. And the only way that can be assured, the only way you can guarantee that, oh, let me go back to what I said earlier. You have to have that quiet time with the Lord in his presence 
as he strengthens you. Otherwise, you'll fall. Otherwise, you'll fall. Now the servants and the officers made the call of fire, and Peter warmed himself. And now we go back to the trial, verse 19. And the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answered, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always met. And in secret, I have said nothing. I'm not an occultist. This is not a cult. This is not a secret society, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of secret societies today, aren't there? Yeah. A lot of groups who have all of this secret esoteric knowledge and, and you got to get further into the inner circle in order to receive all of that knowledge. <laughs> there was a, a Bible teacher I, I used to love listening to, but you know, he just got off a little bit and uh, got off quite a bit actually. But, but he, he was forming these groups and you could be a member, you could be a silver member, you could be a bronze member, but you could be a, a, a gold member. So there were a bronze medallion, a silver medallion, and then a gold medallion. And if you were a gold medallion member, he gave you all of this special inside information that nobody else would have. Be careful, beloved, when he... What did Jesus say? No, 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 I spoke openly. Freely I have received, freely we give, right? Yeah. Jesus did nothing in secret. And even what he taught to his disciples in private was the same thing he taught publicly. There was no difference. There was no disparity. So too with our lives, you know, if you, if you have an opportunity to have a public platform, then who you are in public should be exactly who you are in private. There should be no difference, you see. That's the problem today. Yeah. So Jesus responded, and I spoke openly, but all of these illegalities that were taking place, sensing him at night, which should have never taken place, and trying to get, and force a, a, a confession out of him, an accusation, and then something else is going to take place that's illegal. Verse 22, did I read verse 21? Why do you ask me, he said. Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Well, that was illegal, wasn't it? To strike an innocent man. He wasn't convicted yet. They didn't find him guilty of anything yet. And yet they struck him. Jesus answered and said, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now we go back to Peter. This is where we'll, we'll end this little section here. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off. Hmm. In the Old Testament, what would this man be? If, if Peter was successful in taking off Malchus', Malchus head, then who would this person be? The avenger of blood. Huh? Avenger of blood. This person would be the avenger of blood. Now, th this person knows that uh, I, I, I can't explain any of this, but I saw this man strike my, my cousin with that sword. He took off his ear, but I saw the other man just touch him and miraculously, and I don't know what I saw. <laughs> but something's not right here. But here, this guy's a witness to what Peter did. So he knows that Peter is a disciple of Christ, that he was trying to defend Christ there. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter began to curse. Now, we're, we're told that in Luke's gospel. In Matthew's gospel, he began to curse, and he denied him again for the third time now. And Luke tells us at that very moment as Jesus is being tried and Peter is over here denying the Lord and for the third time he denies him and then suddenly the rooster. And what did Jesus do? He looked at Peter. 
What kind of a look do you think he gave Peter? No, we, we don't know because the text doesn't tell us. Was it one of these? <laughs> no. I'll get you. Was that? What kind of a look do you think he gave Peter? That's Compassion. He already told Peter what he was going to do. Jesus knew everything that was going to take place, and he willingly laid down his life. And he knew precisely what was going to happen, but he knew precisely what he was going to do in just, just a few days, about 43 days from now. What was he going to do? Restore Peter. Put Peter back into his service. He made a misstep, but it wasn't his heart, you know. No. Let's read the text, and then we got some questions. Peter then denied, and immediately the rooster crowed. And Jesus looked at Peter with compassion, with sympathy, with love, and with understanding. What was going on in Peter? What, what made the difference between this bold, courageous, strong man of a man who, who was willing to risk his life for Jesus just a few hours earlier in the garden, and now he's denying him in, before this little servant girl and a couple servants of the high priest there in the courtyard by a fire? What's the difference? What happened? Now, in both cases, Jesus, Peter wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit yet. He didn't have the Holy Spirit when he drew his sword, and he doesn't have the Holy Spirit now. But what was the difference? Well, last week, I, I ended here, and I asked you to go think about this and tell me what the problem was, because you can suffer the same fate, you and I. So not all at once. <laughs> Raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Yes. Okay. But then when he got there, fear took him over because he's now surrounded by his circumstances just like when he walked when he took his eyes off Jesus. Okay. He looked at his circumstances of fear, but then he started to doubt. Did Jesus really say this? Is this the promise true? Am I going to... Okay. I can accept that. Terry? I think in a lot of ways, when you, when you face that dark night of the soul, you go in shock. Mm -hmm. And everything that you thought, everything that Peter thought was going to happen, mm -hmm. was gone. Just like that. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else? Yes, Pat? Jesus wasn't there. Jesus, Jesus wasn't, wasn't there. He was separated yeah. from by some distance, but Jesus looked at him. Jesus was there in that courtyard. Peter and John were witnessing this. And when Peter denied Jesus, Luke tells us Jesus looked over at Peter. They made eye contact. But why? What's the difference in Peter? I think Terry is hitting on it. Deborah's hitting on it. Listen to me. You can have an unrealistic expectation of what you expect God to do. Peter saw Jesus cleanse the leper. Peter saw Jesus give sight to the blind. Peter saw Jesus calm the sea. He had control over disease. He had control over nature. He, Peter saw Jesus take control over the grave. In chapter 11, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Peter expected Jesus to do something miraculous, to perform some mighty, powerful work, more greater than a Samson in overthrowing this occupation of the Romans, in, in fighting against this injustice that was taking place, Peter didn't understand that Jesus was going to win by losing. How do you win? By losing. We, listen, we win by offering our life to Jesus in whatever service he calls us to. As, listen to me. Things are going to get very difficult in the world. How much difficult they're going to be here, I don't know. But you better not have an expectation of the security and the prosperity and, and, and your vision of the American dream in your head that when it comes crashing down, so does your faith. Peter was confused. Peter was frustrated. Peter was angry. It wasn't supposed to work out this way. Right. When you pray for that healing, you don't get it your way. Oh, boy. Yeah. 
Yeah, when you pray and, and you pray and you cry and, and the Lord takes them. And so that's, that's what happened to Peter. Peter had an unrealistic expectation of what God was going to allow and what God was going to do. So did Judas. The same thing. Now, beloved, you need to understand that God has prescribed a degree of suffering for all of us to perfect us. Um, the time we have left, turn to me to Second Chronicles, Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter four. Turn there. No one understood that more than Paul. What was Paul's expectation in the beginning of his life as a young man? He was going to rise to the top. He was going to become a mover and shaker. He was going to be controlling all of Israel. And he had the smarts. He had the ability. God had equipped him and gifted him. But then he recognized that's not at all who he was. And then he discovered who he was in the will of God. In the will of God, he would be the chief persecuted, not the chief persecutor. He would be persecuted for the cause of Christ more than any other man at that time. Wow, he didn't expect that. Now, listen to me. We have no right to put an expectation upon God. The only right we have is to serve God. Yes, Lord. You can't call him Lord, Lord, and then say, no, Lord. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? Paul understood that his expectations for his life it was all wrong. Look with me in uh, Corinthians. In, in the book of Philippians, he writes and he says, I have suffered the loss of all things, all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, in whom I serve. And I count them all, all those previous things that I held so dear, I count them all as rubbish compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Hmm? But just for our conversation, look at chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. What did I say? Maybe that's what I meant. Let me look. It's a Corinthian, okay? Hey, how about the third Corinthians? You know, there were four letters to the Corinthians. Two were lost. They were all corrective. Uh, yeah, I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. See, you knew where you were supposed to be. I didn't know. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So let's start in verse 7. But we, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the eternal Spirit in our fleshly bodies, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. For we are hard-pressed tribulation on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. What did he say in Philippians? I purpose to know only two things, the fellowship of his suffering. That's what he's talking about here, fellowship of suffering of Jesus and the power of the resurrection. You'll know the power of the resurrection when you experience the fellowship of his suffering and as he takes you through it for his glory. Please make sure that you understand that God is sovereign and he can do whatever he wants to do. I am simply his servant. And if he desires that I suffer to some degree in this life at this time for his glory, then praise God, so be it. His ways are not. They sure aren't. You know, I would have hit the lottery and given 90% to you. People make those kind of bargains, don't they? Yeah, it's crazy, 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 crazy. Always caring about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. Not only do we want to know the fellowship of his suffering, but what else? The power of the resurrection, the power of living a Christ-like life now. The hope of glory, right? For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. 
So then death is working in us, but life in you. He's talking about the Corinthians now, how he's, he's sacrificed his life for their sake. For since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore we speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with him. The glorious future is not here, it's there. I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord, not of evil, but for good, good to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah prophesied that to the children of Israel when they were going into a 70-year captivity. How old are you, Micah? You're 13, plus 70? 83, right? So you're going to go into a Chinese prison camp, but don't worry, Micah, you're going to be released at 83. What hope and future is that? If you're released. Chinese prison camps, most, most prisoners don't walk out. They're carried out, right? Jeremiah is prophesying to the children of Israel who are going into a 70-year captivity by the Babylonians. That I, I know they have plans I have for you. They're not for evil, they're for good. They give you hope in the future. What hope? What future? Where? Here? No, not here. There. That's why you listen. You have to be kingdom-minded. Not of this earth, but the heavenly kingdom, you see. That's where our expectation can be. And that's an appropriate expectation that God will bring us into his everlasting kingdom and we will experience forever a life of joy and peace and love, free of all concern, of any anxiousness, of any fear. Wow. Yes, verse 14, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise up with, uh, with Jesus our bodies, and we will present us with you. Verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. What things is he talking about that, that has gone on for the sake of the Corinthians? His personal sufferings. I'm not here to tell you that you become a Christian and suddenly life becomes absolutely easy, effortless. No, 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 no. Being a Christian and living for Jesus is going to be the most sacrificial thing you ever do. It will be the most difficult thing that you ever choose to do in your flesh. You understand that? Verse 16, therefore, we do not lose heart. Realistic expectations that God is God and let him be the Lord. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though the outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. You're building up the spiritual man. Physical exercise profiteth little, little. But the spiritual disciplines that you bring into your life will benefit you for an eternity. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying to be foolish. I'm doing everything I can to try to preserve, well, not everything. I can't give up ice cream, you know. I just... You know, <laughs> but verse 17 now, listen, what a, what, a, what a proper perspective Paul had that we need to have for our light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. Do you know who understands that better than anybody right now? That, that this momentary light affliction, not to be compared to that eternal weight of glory. Who, who understands that more than anybody right now? The persecuted church. The persecuted church understands this text far more than we ever will here at the, at the West in all probability. But what Paul's saying is absolutely certain. There is, no, there is nothing that I could give up in this life that equals to what I'm going to gain in the kingdom. Nothing. So don't have an unrealistic expectation of what you expect God to do for you. Or you'll come crashing down in that disappointment and you'll abandon the faith. I've seen it happen far too many times that I'd like to recount. People becoming confused, frustrated, disappointed, and then they abandon the Lord. If this is love, I don't want anything to do with you. Hmm. Just a few more verses in chapter 5. Uh, 
18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. For we know this, that our earthly house, what's he speaking of now? Our bodies, our earthly house, this tent is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If we were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. What's he talking about? John 14, what's he talking about? Is he talking about a house in heaven? Is he talking about a mansion in heaven? He's talking about your glorified body. Because that's what he's referring to here as well. That's what Paul is referring to. The same thing Jesus was referring to. So many people look at that in such a carnal, fleshly, material way. Thinking that somehow they're going to have a mansion in heaven. The place where we abide that brings us such joy, such peace, such confidence, such comfort, such security is abiding in Christ. That's that place. Right? For in this we groan, Paul is talking about the, in groaning for that new body. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed, that our habitation which is from heaven indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up in by life. Death may be swallowed up in life. You recognize that the moment you're born, you're dying. We're all in the process of dying. A hundred out of a hundred right now. A thousand out of a thousand. Somehow, some way, we're all going to leave here if the Lord doesn't come and take us out, right? But what's most important is not this physical temporal existence, but the spiritual eternal life that Jesus is offering us. Verse 5, now he who prepared us for this very thing is God, who will also give us the Spirit as a guarantee. The Spirit has been given to us to guarantee that we have a place in heaven. Peter would say it another way. He'd say, there's a, a place reserved for you for which you are being kept, prevented from escaping. That's the word there, this place. For we, verse 6, chapter 5, so we always, confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we are confident, yes, well, pleased rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Is that really your heart? You know, if you had the opportunity right now, would you want to be in heaven with him? Yes. Yeah. Now, I understand when you're young and you haven't married yet, you know, <laughs> you know uh, that can steal your affection and desire for heaven to some degree. But if you really understand what God is offering you and I, oh, there's no place we'd rather be than to be with him. And that's what Paul is saying here. Therefore, verse 9, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to God. Reach that vanishing point. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust that we are well known in your conscience. So what's he talking about here? What's this judgment seat? The bima. The, now, this is not the great white throne judgment. Understand, no believer goes through the great white throne judgment. That's for unbelievers. But there is a judgment that every believer goes through, and it's called the Bema Seat. Now, what judgment is that? That's a reward. It's like a, a judgment seat or a judge who sits in athletic competition. You get rewarded for winning, but you don't get punished because you didn't win. And what are we supposed to win? being the doulos of Christ. You win by losing. Jesus won by giving up his life. And in the same way, beloved, we win by giving up our lives for Jesus. And at the Bema seat, you receive a reward. The more you've allowed your life to be given away for his sake, the more you have allowed him to work through your life, to touch others. Amen?